Welcome to an international episode of the dissection, a continental dissection. Today, we're going to be talking about the protests that have been happening in Kenya over the last few weeks and some of the developments there. And rather than me trying to act like I know everything that's going on in Kenya, I remembered that I do know people in Kenya. I do know activists who have been on the ground and I reached out to one of them and he graciously agreed to jump on and even be on video for this conversation. So I just wanna say uh, welcome to Juguna Macharia. Macharia, welcome. Thank you so much, Jimmy, for the opportunity. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. Yeah. So just to tell people a little bit about yourselves, uh, Macharia is the founder of the African Debating Academy. He organizes debate events in and around Kenya and East Africa. He's based in Nairobi and he has been at varying degrees parts of this particular protest that has been uh, captivating the global audience, but particularly uh, captivating the youth of uh, Kenya. So let's start with the first question, and that would be, what were the expectations of young people when President Ruto came into office? Um, thank you so much. Um, I think as someone who was an avid follower of William Ruto, especially during his campaign trail, uh, the expectations of young people at the time because of the platform he campaigned on was one of economic transformation. He ran on the hustler narrative or the narrative that, you know, in a lot of times, the people who end up being left out of government are those who are hustlers, the young people who, you know, need to come up from nothing to something. He used himself as an example of a hustler who was once a chicken seller to becoming a president. And so the entire... Um, campaign platform was that of economic transformation of the country. So a lot of young people were looking forward to that hustler transformation of the country where the young and the informal and the, you know, the, 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 the 90 percent of the country where it's not formal employment would become at the center and at the for focus and would be the focus of government policy so he was a hustler leader he would run on economic transformation and i think a lot of young people were looking forward to that economic transformation or at least being part of the government as hustlers mm. so what triggered these particular protests these 2024 uh, stop the tax bill protest. Take us into how this became a rallying call for the youth of Kenya. I think like most problems or like most of these revolutions, it started with a tweet. It actually just started with young people on social media tweeting and saying that the current proposed finance bill, as you know, every year government has a finance bill in terms of that tries to govern how they will raise revenue to meet budget targets. And so when the finance bill was released, I think people started showing their discontent because there were um, varying proposals for increasing tax on basic commodities such as edible oils, things like uh, sanitary pads, things like financial transactions, bread, which is like a basic commodity. And notice at this point, people have been struggling a lot because of the increasing cost of living that had been going on since the early 2020s. So a lot of the discontent started on social media where people were like, this is a bit unbearable. You cannot tax bread. You cannot tax, uh, what is it called? Financial transactions. It will just make everything more expensive. And so at the point where people now started noticing that the government is not listening to their discontent about the issue, uh, they then decided to organize small protests outside parliament. Now, what they thought would be small protests ended up being nationwide cries against this finance bill. So the target of people's anger was largely around the tax proposals that were proposed by the government to raise revenue. And it was taken out on this finance bill at the time. And it then morphed into something else, something that I don't think anyone, including the president or anyone who is in government, expected. So it's, it was just a young people's discontent against the tax bill and the increased prices and the increased taxes. And then it morphed into something else, which I'm sure we'll discuss a bit later. Mm. So this particular set of uh, tax increases has been proposed to deal with the Kenyan debt crisis, from my understanding. And it's also my understanding that Kenya has taken a variety of euro bonds over the various years, which have been used for various infrastructure projects. For example, the Standard Gorge Railway, for example, the Aurora and Kimwarera uh, dam projects. So I want to ask you, 
what are your reflections as a young Kenyan about the value of all of these infrastructure projects, the management of the money in all of these infrastructure projects, as well as if they were actually good use of these international uh, loans that were acquired by the government. Sorry, I lost you there. So I was uh, saying, what do you think about yeah. what do you think about all of these particular um, projects that have been run, the infrastructure projects, and are they good use of Kenyan money? Um, thank you so much. Um, I, the issue of euro bonds and the issue of debt is actually at the center of the problem with Kenya. Because if you listen to what the president is saying, he's saying that we are heavily indebted and the current revenues that we are collecting is not enough to cater for both development and debt repayment. So we do need to increase our revenue in order for us to be able to pay this Debt. And part of the problem of the debt is what you're mentioning, things like the euro bonds and many other uh, bonds and many other uh, loans from the IMF, from the World Bank that have been taken by the government in order to finance budget deficits since, uh, I don't know, since 20, since the previous government and even governments before. So it's an intergenerational problem. As to the value and the management of these projects, I think it's very clear up till now that nobody can account for the $2 billion euro bond that was collected by the previous government, which he was part of. And I think up till today, the government is still unable to account for what did we spend $2 billion on in this country? Because other than maybe the Standard Gauge Railway, which is not even part of the euro bond debt, that was a different sovereign bond from the Republic of China. And the Aurora and Kimorel jams, that dam did not even end up getting built. So up to today, there's still genuine discontent as to what was the money for. And the president is in a precarious situation because the euro bond debts were maturing, and I think they were maturing most of them this year, and we needed to raise hundreds of millions of dollars to pay that money back, which is why he is famously nicknamed Zacchaeus or Zakayo, who was the tax collector in the Bible, because he had to immediately got into government. He had to increase taxes quite drastically so that they can be able to raise some form of revenue to at least try and finance the repayment of these bonds. And he had to take up more loans. As part of the problem people have with him is that he's taken up a lot of loans in his first two years. And part of his reasoning here is that we need to repay back all the bonds we took in previous governments because any form of debt default, as you know, has catastrophic impacts on the government. So they needed to find money somewhere. So that ended up causing a problem. But here's the problem. And I think this is what everyone is asking. All this money we are borrowing, all this money we've borrowed in subsequent regimes or from previous regimes, where is it? Because people cannot feel the, the impact of this. Um, I mean, $1 billion doesn't just disappear into a country, right? You need to show what you spent it on and nobody can be able to account for that, which is part of the fuel for this problem of the finance bill, which is you want to increase taxes again. Where is this money going? We are not seeing the impact of it. Where exactly are you spending it on? And I think this is part of the problem with the country uh, right now, which is the euro bond that we took last time has no accountability. Nobody knows where it went. Uh, you cannot feel the impact of that euro bond. He's taken up another one. They're floating a new one, I think, uh, this year or next year. And now people are asking, surely, what, why, why do we keep putting ourselves in these situations, um, yet we cannot even account for the little revenue we have? Okay. That's a, that's a that's a good observation um, from the youth, and I think it's valid, and many people support it. But then the economics question is: Where then do the youth of Kenya believe this money should come from? Surely you've still got to pay the debt. So can you tell us when it comes to addressing the issue of the debt that Kenya is currently facing? What are the views of the protesters in the way in which that debt burden needs to be addressed? I think um, a lot of the reject finance bill and how it morphed, as I was explaining, from being about the finance bill and about bigger issues, people started now bringing into focus and question, how do we spend money? And I think it seems to be that the young people's diagnosis and solution to the problem is to tame runaway corruption, which has been taming, which has been ravaging the country for a very long time. And what they seem to be saying is that we need to curb wastage of public resources on things that are seen as almost not important. So for example, in the previous budget or the budget that was not the previous one, the current one that the government proposed, they proposed for example, money to be given to the spouses of the president and the deputy president to the tune of 2 oh. billion shillings. 
they started asking for accountability for why do, why is there an office of the wife of the president why do they need mm. a billion shillings to be spent on them what exactly is this for there were questions about spending more and more money on defense for example the defense was getting an increased allocation and there was a lot of like r- questions asked about why what exactly are we spending money on that is so necessary for the type of taxes that you're proposing on basic commodities like bread and cooking oil and stuff like this so the young people seem to be saying the solution to this problem is to curb wastage and also they brought out the issue of government flamboyance when ministers are wearing watches worth fifty thousand dollars when they're wearing shoes worth five thousand dollars it seems to be that on a minister's salary you should not be affording such things so that means there is wastage of public resources that is going or currently going on in the government and here's the problem the kk government or the kasla government or the current government was very explicit that they're not running on an anti-corruption platform they were very clear that we are not here to run or to deal with issues of anti-corruption in fact the other government or their opponents are the ones who seem to be a bit more focused on that and yet at this point in time, at the point of revolution, at the precipice, the president has had to turn around and say, okay, we need to also deal with how we are spending money as a government. So the young people have said, cut your spending. Let's go into you know, austerity. Let's try curb runaway corruption. That should account for a lot of savings that don't require us to then have to increase taxes. The previous president is on record saying that a third of the government's budget is lost to corruption so the young people are saying let's fix that then we don't have to increase any more taxes for young people and for our fathers and mothers again okay that that actually makes a lot of sense one third of the budget being lost to graft and corruption is a significant amount are you happy with before i actually ask you this question about the announcement do you Mm -hmm. think that the government responded correctly to the protesters I mean, it's very clear and very apparent that they did not. I think the government was not prepared for them. I don't think the government knew the magnitude of the discontent. And I think the government was treating this as political hostilities. Remember, the Kenyan government has been dealing with protesters for a very long time. We had Raila Odinga, who has been organizing protests in this country since time immemorial, after every election, after every subsequent year. So the police know how to deal with those type of protesters. But these were young people from majority middle class and many of them were very peaceful unarmed the the government did not know how to deal with them and actually um he pretended or or, or was behaving as if these are rogue political uh anarchists and i think the way in which they meted out force on on citizens is unprecedented to the extent that i think the president is going to have a very difficult time trying to explain why people must die because of a finance bill, something that he's not going to be able to get young people to understand. And I think at this point, uh, the government is having to, and if you listen to the speech, there's a lot of words about things like reflection. They have to reflect about what exactly they were dealing with, because I don't think they've dealt with such a political animal before, a leaderless, faceless, organic, grassroots revolution. And I think they didn't know how to deal with that. So they dealt with it the wrong way using force rather than dialogue this is an example or a typical case of too little too late because every time the government reacted it was too late people were complaining about the tax proposals they changed them the night to the protest or the night to the discussion at that point people are already discontented about it at this point when the finance bill was in parliament by the time he's returning it people are asking like today he's decided to reject it why didn't he reject it four days ago or three days ago it's been a case of too little too late and i think the young protesters have shown the government that it's no longer more the normal modus operandi that they have to check themselves because they are going to have a very uphill task gaining back the trust of the people. And are you happy with the announcement that was made today by President Ruto that they're going to withdraw this bill? Do you think it's a trick? Do you think because parliament is in recess now, all of these things, do you think it comes back um, in any shape or form? Or do you think that they will then make the cuts that um, they suggested? Where are the youth now in terms of reflecting on today? Is this a victory or is it an aluta continua? 
I think it's a looter continuum. I think people are saying that it's now beyond the finance bill. Um, as to what the general mood of people is, I think they now have said this is beyond finance bill. It's about people who are abducted in the process of protesting. It's about people who are killed and injured in the process of protesting. It's about the piousness of leaders to pretend. And in fact, the ministers or the MPs were saying these are just rich kids who don't know what they're saying. These are people who, you know, they come with iPhones, they take Ubers to the protest, they eat KFC immediately after. That's what they were calling them. And it was just that lack of humility to believe that these young people can have thoughts about these things. In fact, there was a claim that this was a sponsored protest to believe that young people in their own brilliance cannot imagine that they can protest against a government. Somebody must have sponsored them. I think the anger of the people is not quenched, especially because of the president's, he did not address the core issues, issues to do with abductions, issues to do with protesters being killed, protesters being injured. Why did people have to go through all this for you to reach the position you have reached now? So the feeling among the people is that this is a lucha continua. As to how it proceeds is what I am very interested in also observing because remember, this is a leaderless, faceless movement. So right now the government is playing a very interesting divide and conquer because they're like, we've apologized, we've removed this thing. The focus of your anger is now gone. Can we move on? So now people are having different conversation. Do we accept that this is now gone we can be angry we will not forgive and forget but we don't longer need to protest other people are saying no we must continue to protest until justice is given to those who lost their lives those who are injured those who are abducted to today we still don't know some of them where they are so it's 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 something that will i think evolve and morph into something else i guess we will be seeing in the next few days what sort of response the young people uh, have on the government or, or give to the government well, thank you so much. I just have one last question for you uh, about these events. What do you think this means for the legacy of President Ruto? I think it's a stain, and it's a very big stain on his legacy. I think he came in on the backs of young people and young hustlers. Those are the people who put him in power. Those are the people who voted for him in droves because they were against the status quo. They were against the dynasties. They were against the way in which the government was being run. To turn around and go back to those people, kill them, brutalize them, hurt them because of a finance bill, something that is just supposed to raise money and for raising their voices against you. I think he has really, and to, to be honest, the, the, the best example of this stain is the speech he gave last night. Today is Wednesday. If you watch his speech yesterday night, when he referred to young protesters as treasonous criminals, when he referred to them as people who are, are against the state, that moment there, a lack of apology after people dying, the lack of compassion and empathy at a point where people are hurting is really going to stain him. And he's going to really struggle to, to, to clean his image to the young people and show them that I am still for you because these are the people who put him in power. So I think it's going to be a difficult and uphill task and a stain for sure that will never be forgotten by the young people. Um, as to how he recovers from it, I guess we will see. Um, mm. But he's going struggle he's mm. going to really struggle i'm just thinking of one question that I, I i think i should perhaps ask is how did you find the role of the media whether it's local media or international media in covering this protest i think i saw some way that one of the media houses was being criticized i can't remember whether it's ktv or ntv but maybe can you reflect on that as well i saw larry uh, madao was actually very active as well on yeah. the ground what is your reflection about the role of the media in this historic moment to be honest i think the media in this specific instance played a very critical role that for the first time in my analysis of the situation were largely very unbiased and actually were looking for the correct information usually when we deal with political protests media shows its face in terms of where its bias lies in terms of the political divide who they support and who they don't but on this one everyone seemed to be with the young people to be the revolution there was very little pro state uh what is it called propaganda 
propaganda being shared by mainstream media. And I think mainstream media was at the forefront of recording some of the human rights abuses that were going on on the streets. They were showing, as you could see, Larry was showing himself being tear gassed by police. There's video evidence from the media itself of people being shot outside parliament and people dying while they're trying to cross. It was actively recorded. And I think this is something that I think was almost new and refreshing to see that media can, in a, in a situation like this, be unbiased and show the true picture of what was going on. Right now, the president announced that six people have died in the protest. The next thing you see on the media is they are saying 23 people have died. They're actually doing their job and fact checking and double checking what the government is saying. So it's very refreshing to see the role that, of course, they can do more. But I think my reflection of this is that it's been largely very unbiased. And they have been almost like pro-protesters, not pro-protesters by favoring them, but actually showing the true picture of what is going on and not hiding the facts, the statistics like they usually do with other protests. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Macharia. We really appreciate your contribution and hopefully we can get you back on to give us an update if the story develops much further. Definitely. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed that interview. I'm going to try to do more interviews like that so we can get on the ground perspectives. If you enjoyed that interview, if you have comments, please let's jump into the comment section. Let's have a conversation. 86% of the people watching the channel have not yet subscribed. Please subscribe. What do you think? Do you think that there are lessons for the rest of Africa from everything that's happening in Kenya? Do you think that the people of Zimbabwe could learn a lesson or two from the youth of Kenya? Do you think that the people of Eswatini, for example, could learn a thing or two? Do you think that the youth of South Africa could learn a thing or two from the youth of Kenya? Let's have a conversation. Today, the president issued this statement. I'm just going to play it for you, and then you're going to see what he said and whether you agree with him or not. Till the next one. And this will be on matters that are contained in the bill and matters that the people of Kenya have canvassed in the conversation that has been going on. In this regard as well, I am directing for immediate further austerity measures to reduce expenditure, starting with the office of the president, the entire presidency, and extending to the entire executive arm of government. Operational expenditure in the presidency be reduced to remove allocations for the confidential fault, reduce travel, hospitality, purchase of motor vehicles, renovations, and other expenditures. This will cover the entire presidency and also the executive arm of government. I also propose that equally, Parliament, the judiciary, and county governments, working with the National Treasury, also undertake budget cuts and austerity to ensure that we do live within our means, respecting the very loud message that is coming from the people of Kenya. And let me confirm that I have discussed with many uh, stakeholders. I will be meeting some of them uh, shortly after this meeting on charting a way forward that makes sure that we carry the whole nation in this very important journey as we go into the future as a country. Let me also confirm that as we deal with austerity, the loud message on dealing firmly, decisively, and expeditiously with corruption is a matter that we have discussed and we have agreed that it will take the front banner as we go into the future. 
We will continue to do this and carry out this very important conversation. And I want to remind us that we should proceed within the foundational principles upon which our nation is founded, namely constitutionalism, adherence to the rule of law, and respect for constitutional institutions. We must continue to operate within the parameters of the law. I thank you. I will uh, take a few questions, three questions to be specific. Thank you, Your Excellency. And the first question will start with Elizabeth Mutuku from TV47. Good evening. My question is on young leaders from the Gen Z uh, generation who were abducted yesterday and uh, the, the day before yesterday. What happens to that? Second, there were young people who were killed during the demonstrations. What do you speak of that as the head of state? Thirdly, how do we move forward on the budget cuts, especially now that you've said that uh, we're going to have austerity measures, yes, but how 